Good morning, everybody, and um, thank you very much for, for coming along. Uh, it's, it's, it's always interesting when you're asked to, to speak on a specific, specific topic, um, rather than something that you, you kind of take as your day-to-day -to -day job and, and something that you do all the time. So hopefully um, we'll get something out of today and uh, you have an opportunity to ask, ask questions at the end. Um, I will touch on the, the fact I had to, to coach at some point during the Six Nations, but it's not something I like to, to reflect on very often. It's one of those ones that you put in the back, in the back corner and, and don't, don't look at too often. But um, today, I just want to talk about um, change is a constant for performance. I um, was asked to talk about change um, and on reflecting about change within leadership, one of the things that uh, I reflected on was that within a performance environment, um, changes, change happens all the time. Change happens on a daily basis. Um, that old adage that says insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is, ab is, is actually about performance. We work all the time in terms of looking at ways to beat the opposition and the opposition look at ways to to beat us. So if we're doing the same thing all, all the time, even if we're looking at increasing results, better consistency of results, then all that we're doing is the same thing. So we have to change. We have to look at what we're doing, how we're doing it, look at how we modify what we're doing to look at structures, processes, um, as, well, as well as the sort of smaller smaller day-to-day -day things. Um, you know, after, after coming second in the World Cup in, in 2010, we changed, the, we changed the program, we changed the people. After winning the World Cup in 2014, we changed the staff, we changed the program. After coming second in the World Cup in 2017, we've changed the program, we've changed the people. So all the time we're moving, we're changing, we're looking at, at things that, that we evolve all the time. Um, my presentation today doesn't involve any models, quotes. It's, it's, it's very much about, I suppose, who I am and how that's, that's shaped my leadership style to start with. But probably more importantly, what my journey's been and key examples of, of change and how we've dealt with change, implemented change, um, and some of the challenges that we've, that we've found with that. So definitely... It's, it's the good and the bad, quite a lot of the, the, not, uh, the bits that don't work very well um, uh, and hopefully that you can, you can get something, something out of that. Sorry. Apologies, for, apologies for the paper and being old school, talking about that earlier. Change, is the, change to technology is the bit that we haven't probably quite got right yet. Um, so to, to start with, who am I? Um, I think it's, it's, it's important to understand some of the, the leadership things by understanding probably who I am. Um, I grew up in, uh, in the middle of England in a, in a small, relatively small town outside Birmingham called Solihull. Um, there's no water there, but actually one of the very first sports that I ever did was sailing because uh, my parents sailed. I spent a lot of time in Wales and sailing became sailing became one of my my passions but i think sport was actually one of the things that i did if there was a sports team in school then i was part of that sports team in school um, from tennis to squash to badminton to netball even though i was told that actually i was so vertically challenged i was never ever going to progress too far with that <laughs> hockey you know if it was there i played it um, Sailing became more and more of a, a part of my life. Um, I sailed for, for Great Britain at world and European level. And then I went to, to Loughborough University and developed a, developed a passion for, for rugby. I'd, I'd wanted to do something a bit different. Um, last thing my mother said when I walked out the door was don't play rugby. So the first thing I did was join the rugby team. Um, it's one of those things about leaving home, isn't it? Uh, so I, I started playing rugby, 
it was a game that suited me. It was, it was everything that, you know, I enjoyed when I played hockey. I ran through people as opposed to round people and all of those bits that you, you're not supposed to do. I played in the first england Wales game in 1987. Um, so that was the first, first time England had played. Uh, it is a long time ago now. Things have moved on a, a massive piece from there. Um, but I think the... You know, I still still a lot of sailing. My first job was working for the Welsh Yachting Association, um, and actually, it was the reason for for mentioning that is as I come on to what my leadership influences are. The the very first my very first boss was absolutely outstanding as a leader and as a boss, and has shaped a lot of the way that that I've I've worked. Um, I think all of the roles that I've had since then have very much been sports-based, not nine to five. Um, and I've been, I've been involved in a whole range of different things and had the opportunity to be in the right place at the right time, I think. Um, I say, work for the Welsh Yachting Associ Association, but spent time as a, as a coach assessor, was one of the first coach assessors for the Royal Yachting Association at 21, training potential instructors, potential senior instructors within, within that environment. So always had, I suppose, the opportunity to, to lead and drive things, drive things forward. And I think in, in some respects, as I say, right place at the right time, it's not something I've necessarily gone out to, to do within my roles. Uh, I've always wanted to push things forward. I've always wanted to shape things and drive things, but not necessarily sort out leadership positions to do so. It's just about trying to, to change things and, and move things forward. So the reason this is a, is a pink slide here. I'm going to put something on it in a second. Um, as part of a, an exercise through a, a formal piece of leadership training that um, I did not that, not that long ago, I was asked to actually kind of sum up you know, what I'd done, my background, and, and who that made me. Um, so I came up, with, came up with four things. And the first one was, <coughs> was self-reliance. So for those of you who don't know, this is a, this is a laser. This is the type of boat I, I sailed primarily um, on the international stage. Uh, and for those of you who, who don't sail very much, when you're out there, um, it's down to you to get your boat together. It's down to you to get your boat on the water. It's down to you to get yourself from A to B to fix the bits that go wrong. Um, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of support there. So self-reliance was a, was a big piece of of who I am and what I do, um, probably too much so in terms of not necessarily asking for help when I should, uh, but it's about just, right, okay, well, I need to do that, so I need to get on with it, and I need to make it happen. Um, as the, the example of, that I give is that, you know, at 18, I passed my test, because my parents had stopped me driving for 12 months because I'd nagged them too many times. Um, but at 18, I passed my test three weeks later, I had to put the boat on the back of a car, drive to Germany, and enter a regatta. But nobody had actually taught me how to reverse with the trailer on the back. I had to take the trailer, wheel the trailer off with the boat on the back, off the, off the ferry, turn it round, drive the car off, and hook, hook them back up again. So, you know, but that was a, it's finding a way of doing things, and it's, it's actually moving those things, moving those things forward. Um, the second thing is... is um, Responsibility. I've always taken responsibility on. It's not something that, as again, to, same as leadership, it's not something I've ever sort of sought out to, to say, oh, I, I need responsibility for that. It's just about, oh, well, yeah, I've got to do that, and I've got to do that, and just taking that, that piece of, of responsibility on. The third thing is, is passion. Um, I say... Sport has always played a huge part in my life, and I'm passionate about what I do. 
I'm passionate about working in sport. I'm passionate in the, about the jobs that, that I've done. Um, and, and I think that that's reflected in, in the way I, that I work and the way that I try and, try and move things forward. It's not, it's not good enough just to be as it is now. The passion is to drive, thing for, drive things forward and, and to get things better. Um, and, and then the last thing, which is slightly different probably from, from the, other, the other two, um, is, a, is about integrity. Uh, as I say, it, it was an exercise that, that, was, that I was asked to do, that I worked with a, a coach on actually delivering this. It's quite difficult to find something on integrity when you're trying to put a picture together. But I think, you know, probably this sums it up. You know, does my, does my butt look big in this? You know, how you answer that question is really, is really important. You can go for the really honest approach. Or you can go for the approach that says, I've got to give somebody the right answer, but how I give them that answer is, is probably a, a good way of, of thinking about things. Um, I, I suppose the, the, be, the way I would sum that up is probably, you know, I treat people as if I w as ha how I want to be treated, um, rather than, you know, it's, it's a, but is it a really direct approach? Probably not, but actually, le let's, let's go for a, a slightly more caring approach, I think. Um, so, coming on to leadership, uh, what, have, what have been my leadership influences? Um, I just wanted to sort of identify, I suppose, leadership influences for me have been a journey. It's not a, it's not necessarily something that I know the answers to now. I think we're always influenced all of the time. Um, but I just tried to, try to sort of summarise this in terms of, I think a lot of leadership influences are informal. Um, who, I've, who I've been led and managed by, what I like and what I don't like from the way that they've managed me, um, alongside some more formal um, leadership work through doing an MBA, through um, an RFU leadership development programme, through a ho home country leadership, leadership programme. Um, I think... I've had some really, really, uh, what I would determine as, as good leaders, um, been fortunate, fortunate enough to work with those leaders. Um, you know, from Bill Hughes, who was, the, uh, who was in charge of the Welsh Yachting Association when I was employed by them, <laughs> um, to, to Jim Greenwood. So for those old rugby fans, uh, may know the name Jim Greenwood, um, but I was fortunate, fortunate enough to be coached by Jim when I was at, at Loughborough University. And the way he managed, coached, led the team probably have given me some of the most lasting impressions of anybody that I've ever worked with. Um, I had a I worked under a, a managing director at the RFUW, um, Rosie Williams, who, if any of you have, have come across her, is an Australian, we won't hold that against her too much, but um, is, is an outstanding people leader in terms of getting the best out of, out of people all the time. Um, in terms of how she challenges what she lets you get away with and what she doesn't, um, but at the same time giving a level of autonomy to go and try things, to see what works and to see what, what doesn't work. Um, I think you know, th those are probably key people that, are, that I've worked with, but what have I learned from them? Um, I think for me, all of those people have given me um, a level of autonomy and, and responsibility. Um, they've challenged me. They've given me different levels of, of challenge. Now, I don't always like challenge, because I think what I'm doing is right most of the time. But actually, I know it makes me better. 
So challenge is, is good and therefore mm -hmm. it's it it keeps me going in it keeps me going in the right direction. If I get if I don't get challenged, it's very easy to go off at, at tangents. It's very easy to be, yeah, I'm right, I'm I'm moving in, in that right direction. So challenge it, it challenge is key. I think one of the one of the bits for me is that everybody's trusted me, everybody's given me respect. Um, uh, but but trust primarily in terms of in terms of what what I've had, and they've given me time in in their schedules to to talk to them to discuss to look at to look at options and and, and actually sort of built from built from there, um, and they've allowed me to to challenge. Um, challenge what the norm is and try different things. They've also all had a huge amount of enthusiasm and passion for what they do, which transfers to everybody else in, in terms of how that, that works. Um, in terms of formal learning, you know, there's, the, I suppose, four bits. There's loads that you, you, can, you can take from. But, you know, understanding why vision's important, I think, the formal learning piece for me probably has just has just made sure that it's cemented certain things in 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 my mind, um, and one of those things was actually making sure that the vision is is right and absolutely spot on. Um, it's about understanding that actually everybody has different motivations, so that not everybody's the same. What, why you do something to why you do something is actually very different, even if it's the same thing. But understanding that, that everybody's got different motivations. The culture and environment actually drive a lot of what we do um, and how we work. And when we come back to talk about performance and change, culture and environment is absolutely fundamental in terms of getting that culture in terms of getting that change right, in terms of getting that performance piece right. Um, and they've given me lots of tools and models, but you know, they're there, they're in the background. I'm not sure that it's, for me, specifically things that I necessarily refer back to. It's more, it's more the things that I've talked about. And probably for me, the informal piece of learning from others has been the, has been the biggest driver. So just to, to summarise, again, I tried to put some some pictures together. Um, the key things that have influenced me from a leadership perspective. Um, empowerment, trust, responsibility, culture, vision, giving time and recognising motivation are uh, from those people that have influenced me are probably the things that, that I've taken most strongly um, away from away from that. So how does that influence my leadership values and behaviours? Um, I think again pulling pulling this together as um, as part of an exercise I did through a, a formal, a formal programme, understanding myself probably should have been one of those, those things that, that I also got out of it. But identified four th uh, five things, rather, uh, in terms of my values that I believe if I get right most of the time, my values and behaviours, if I get right most of the time, then I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a reasonable place. And it also allows me to refer back to something so that I've got something to, to refer back to if I'm doing a good job, if I'm not doing a good job, if things are not going quite right, then something to refer back to to actually make sure that I'm moving in the right direction. So what are these? Um, setting direction and strategy. Um, the value is, you know, the value is about setting that. I've got to have a clear direction. I've got to have a clear strategy in terms of what I'm doing and how that's and how that's moving forward. But what's the behaviour? It's got to be a shared vision and, and 
it, it's got to be um, it's got to be clear and concise. I have to have the direction and strategy because that's the piece that allows me to make difficult decisions. That's the piece that allows everybody to understand where we're going, why we do certain things, and why the change potentially happens, and where we're going for performance, and what that looks like. The inspire piece, it, it, it might say inspire, it might say, it might say passion. I think they're all really similar, similar words. Um, but I think part of my role as a leader is to inspire, is to inspire the people that, that work for me. And it's to inspire them to understand that they can do things, that there's a growth mindset, that they want to be part of the journey that I'm, I'm going on and that they're going on and that we are going on together. Um, and I think I do that by walking the walk. Um, I get my hands dirty to, to do the things that I'm asking them to do. Uh, I, went to the, I went to the World Cup in um, 2017 and we go with a really, uh, really restricted staff team in that we only en we're only allowed um, 10 accreditations through, that, uh, through the World Cup. Um, as we go through those, uh, those accreditations, we get down to the point where, well, who's going to help with X, Y, or Z? We didn't have anybody to look after the kit. So I drove the kit van, I packed, unpacked the kit for the whole tournament. You know, made sure that the bibs were clean, made sure that the, the not so much the shirts were washed because the team manager did that, but, you know, that the nutrition was in place, that the milk was brought, that everything that needed to be done to get the team on the pitch and the team out to training was put in place. So that's what, for me, that was walking the walk. I'm prepared to do it and I'm prepared to do something that doesn't sit on my job description. Is everybody else prepared to do it? And... I think that that's the type of thing that, for me, is really, really important. Um, but also that they understand that if we get into a situation where we need to fight for something, we need to fight for resources, that they know that I'm there fighting, fighting their corner, that we've got a clear picture of why we want it, why we need it done. And actually, it encourages them to... I suppose, inspire their players, inspire other coaches, inspire other people that they're working with. So inspiration, passion is really fundamental for me in terms of one of my values and, and behaviours. Um, empowerment. I know I work best when I'm given the autonomy to go and deliver things. Um, and therefore, I recognise that a lot of other people are, are the same. It's sometimes it's quite difficult because I think there's an element of control freak within me, therefore I struggle some time to um, allow, or to, to just pass things, pass things on. Um, one of my <coughs> very early leadership lessons was not everybody does things the way I would do them. Um, so, People, don't, people aren't wrong if they just do it in a different way to me. Um, so now, understanding what actually empowerment means, giving people autonomy, giving people responsibility, trusting people are going to deliver, um, but being prepared to challenge and to coach them and to support them, for me, is, is, is really important. And a, and a, a key piece for me that I've learnt um, along the way. Influence. Um, Managing upwards, uh, I think, is also a, a key part of of one of my of one of my values and, and behaviours. And I think that's around. Um, I can't wait for things to happen. It might just be because of the environment that I'm in, but actually, I don't wait for things to happen. I can sit there and wait for a decision to be made somewhere else. But if I do that things aren't going to happen. So part of my responsibility 
is to, to push people, to drive people who are going to make those decisions. It's not necessarily me. I can have the vision. I can have the strategy. But actually, I can't necessarily put everything in place. So how can I change that? How can I influence it? And how can I make things happen? Um, and, and other people recognising that is, is really important. Um, and the last piece on, on here um, that's really important to me uh, is the piece about what can I do better? Um, how can I work better? And then going back to, to people that I work with and say, what do you need from me? How can I support you better? Um, and it's that, that people piece, that people management that for me sits within that reflection and reflection review. Um, and as I said at the start, I definitely, 100%, don't do all of these things well all of the time. Um, but actually what it does is give me something to, to come back to and, and question myself and, and challenge myself on, on those things. Um, so how does that translate into what people see from me? Um, primarily a, a transformational leadership style. Um, Key things, you know, this is where we're going. So that piece about setting, that 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 piece about setting the the vision and the strategy. Asking people what they think, their participation in what we're doing, their participation in the journey is key. What do you think? How do you think this is going to work? The inspiring piece, I talked about that in the in the values piece as well. Leading by example is is really important, um, and I think definitely uh, is fundamental in terms of the way that we've got we've got our team working at the moment um, and then one of the things I like to do but I'm not very good at is the piece about coaching what could you achieve how can you do this how can you develop this and actually getting the best out of, of, of people in, in that in that respect so that's a bit about me my leadership style um, my values and, and behaviours. So how does that link to how does that link to, to what we do and, and why change is why change is important, why change is a constant to performance? Um, I think for many people uh, and, and I'm going to talk primarily about some of the bigger pieces of change that we've done within the organization over the last uh, Five or five or six years, because I think they're they're relevant, um, and and people can probably see some of those e examples. So the bigger things for many people, change is hard because it's about the unknown, it's about uncertainty. Um, generally, people want to feel uh, happy, they want to feel satisfied, they want to feel motivated. Change can destroy all of those things. <laughs> You know, it's very easy to affect that dynamic by even talking about change, even talking about things that are potentially going to, to be different. Um, and I think the, the lack of certainty and the people piece around change is, for me, the biggest challenge. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not the processes, it's not the system, because actually they're relatively easy to change. It's about how you work with the people and how you bring the people along with what you're doing and ensure that you can, you can still continue to get the best out of people and support people as, as, as well as you, you possibly can. Um, so... What I've just sort of tried to, to identify is um, what, what process, I suppose, do I use for, for, looking, at, for looking at change? Um, Recognise the need for change. Um, <coughs> it's, always, it's always important. You know, the change, doesn't, change doesn't happen just because you don't change necessarily for change's sake. There needs to be a, a reason. There needs to be a reason for change. You need to understand why. Why, why have we got to that point? Why, therefore, do we need to, to make the change? Because otherwise, 
I think certainly from my perspective, making the wrong change um, is always possible. So actually really going, yeah, we need to make a change, but why do we need to make the change? How have we got to this point is, is really key. Um, I've then put engaged supporters. You should actually say supporters. So there's a typo on there, second typo on that slide, but I do apologise. Um, engaged supporters. So it's really, it's really important in any piece about change, and I talked about you know, making sure, understanding that people do things differently to me, recognising that I can't do everything by myself. Um, supporters of the change, uh, advocates of change, are really important at an early stage, um, one for a number of reasons. One, to help <coughs> guide the change, to check and challenge, and to be advocates in the right place. So you can't necessarily talk to everybody all of the time. You can't talk necessarily all of the political, to, to talk to all of the political people that you need to talk to in order to get change through. So you need advocates for you need advocates for that. Um, so engaging engaging supporters is really important. Planning, again, is for me the the next piece. It's very easy sometimes to rush into change, um, and I think one of the one of the things that we've been relatively good at in terms of the way we've changed is that we haven't necessarily rushed into change. We have planned. But even when you plan, there are, there are often unintended consequences for change. And understanding those, trying to mitigate against those, is really important at, at, an, at an early stage. Articulating the change, you know, what's it actually going to look like? What does it mean? Um, and then engaging stakeholders. It's a cycle because actually there are things there are things ongoing all the time. But kind of once you've you've got through that that piece, um, I think for me, change doesn't stop. Um, there's always uh, things that come in with those changes. So you don't just put a change in place and that's it. There's always a or the it takes a very long time for anything to just become part and parcel of, of, of what you do. There are always things about trying to get that piece better. Um, so you just move on to your normal plan, do, review piece. Um, because I think, as I say, the, the, the piece about unintended consequences um, and longer term change is, is, is really important. So um, three examples. Uh, which is the, the biggest piece probably in terms of what we've done, how we've done it, what that looks like. Um, so my first example, um, a fairly, fairly meaty change for us. Um, the RFUW, which was the organisation I worked for before um, effectively I, I was integrated into the RFU, um, was a small organisation. Um, we had 30 people on the staff. We worked with women's rugby, <coughs> Rugby Football Union for Women, and that's all we did. Um, we weren't part and parcel of the RFU. We had a relatively small turnover, relied solely on government funding to deliver uh, women's rugby, to deliver both performance and development. So we had, you know, it was an agile organisation. We had the ability to, to make changes as, as we wanted to um, without lots of committees to be able to, to have to go through to, to deliver the next piece. Um, so we were in the situation Yep, women's rugby was growing, but it was growing relatively s slowly. It was a, um, it was growing by sort of evolution, I suppose. Funding wasn't going to be infinite. We couldn't necessarily deliver everything that we wanted wanted to do. Um, so we were in a situation where we needed more resources. We needed to 
access the wide team of development officers that the RFU had to start pushing the growth of the women's game in schools, in colleges, to drive the standard of performance at the top level. Um, so we were, we were in a situation where we, we needed to do something, we needed to do something different. Um, there was also the piece on there where we also had a bit of a push. Um, so we'd, we'd been talking about it, we talked about it within the organisation, but we also had a push from government. Government didn't want to be funding two rugby organisations, <coughs> they wanted to be funding one. So a number of different factors that, that, that brought us in, in together. Um, so we were looking very much at, at, okay, so if we need to integrate into the RFU, what does it look like? How does it work? Um, so the process started probably uh, two and a half years before we actually did the final integration. Um, so we'd recognised the need, we've understood the, the context, we'd, we'd identified key people from within the RFU to be involved in the project. We set up um, as that piece about engaging support, um, we set up what we called the, R the uh, Women and Girls Integration Board. It was partly the RFUW, it was partly the RFU, everybody working together to try and look at what integration was, was going to look like. Um, that was in place, we planned, uh, made some quite significant plans, set a date for, for integration, uh, and looked at how the organisation would, would transfer, transfer across. So that was, all going, that was all going fine. I didn't have a particular, particularly strong uh, leadership role within, within, that, um, within that transfer. I was very, we were very clear about how we transferred the performance element across into the performance department of, of the RFU. Uh, but then the um, managing director of the RFU, W, moved across to the RFU, with a different role in the RFU, and I took on the role of managing director of the RFU, W, and supported the last six to eight months of the integration, which was probably the most challenging piece of, of that, that integration. Um, so my role then, we, we, we ultimately integrated, D-Day was the 1st of July 2012, <laughs> um, and I took over the role in, uh, just before Christmas of, the, of, that, uh, of 2011 to manage the, the last part of the process. Um, I think the, 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 key, the key challenges with, with this change on the whole, it was definitely the right thing to do. We needed more resources. We needed to become part of a, a bigger organisation. We'd set up a clear uh, infrastructure with the Women and Girls, Integra Women and Girls Integration Board. Um, that, was, that was fine. The things that we didn't do, and we didn't do very well, um, we didn't engage the staff properly. A um, couple of reasons for this. So when I talk about staff, I talk about staff primarily with the RFUW, but also staff within the RFU. There was a group of people working on what the integration piece was looking like, but we didn't, we didn't really keep the staff with us enough. They weren't involved in the long-term planning and understanding what was, what was happening. There was a huge amount of uncertainty in terms of would they be transferred across? Would they, would they have jobs? What were their jobs going to look like? Who were they going to be working with? Who were they going to be working for? We didn't have, and part of the challenge was we didn't have that information until fairly close to the end. Um, but I think one of the things I reflect on um, is that we needed to talk to them. We needed to give them more information. We needed to give them as much information as, as we possibly could. The other side of the coin was we probably, I 
talk about the royal we. I think the, uh, the other side of the coin is the RFU piece hadn't engaged their staff as effectively as possible. So we hadn't talked to the staff that the women's teams were coming into to say, they're coming in, it's going to look like this, we're going to have to work together um, and actually really clarify what it was going to look like. There was a huge amount of uncertainty for, for a fair amount of time. Um, and I think I've put outline the intent there and I think the, the piece for me was we talked about, you know, we, we were really clear about why we were doing it and, and what we were doing. But the staff, the, the stakeholders, didn't, didn't have as much knowledge of that, so we needed to do that better. Um, and then when we did get to the point where we're giving clear messages, don't forget people are, still, are individuals, and it's all about what does it mean for me. You've given me a message, and this is the big picture, but ultimately what does it mean for me? Um, so I think those were the sort of some of the some of the the lessons within that whole change piece that um, I would I would walk away from it and try and try and do better try and do better next time. Um, the next the next example I've got um, is around player contracts. So some of you will have seen in the news, uh, as we went into the World Cup, timing was fantastic for this, as we went into the World Cup, there was a lot of news headlines that we were, the RFU were sort of abandoning the women's programme and we were <coughs> stopping contracts and that nobody knew what was happening and nobody knew what was going to happen uh, post-World Cup. In actual fact, that wasn't, that wasn't the case. But just wanted to sort of... As the, as the example and as the change management example, just talk through the whole history of the, of the player contracts piece. Um, in 2009, it was agreed that Sevens was going to be in the Olympics. At that point, a number of national um, Olympic committees started funding their... Uh, Sevens programmes, made the players full-time. Uh, we weren't in a position to do that. One, we were English. Two, UK Sport thought rugby had enough money. Um, so we couldn't get any funding from, from UK Sport. So we had to get money from, from the RFU. We, we, the reason w for doing it and our, our understanding for doing it was that actually we needed to put our players on a full-time programme. To compete against the rest of the world, we need to put our players on a full-time programme. So what did that look like? Um, we, agreed a time, we agreed our vision, which was to have full-time contracts for, for the Sevens programme. We agreed that it was initially the first two years, because that was Olympic qualification and the year of the Olympic Games. We then also agreed as part of our strategy that the World Cup was then the m next most important thing that we, that we wanted to do. Um, so that's the 15s World Cup. And then we also agreed that post-World Cup, the next most important thing we needed to do was look at Commonwealth Games and Sevens World Cup. So what we were looking at when we talk about player contracts is very much around prioritisation of resources. What was, the, what was the most important piece in the women's performance calendar in any one year? And therefore, how are we going to prioritise our resources for that? Um, so we moved to full-time programme post for, for Sevens, post-2014 World Cup. We moved, um, we moved 20 players into that programme. Uh, they were pretty happy, those 20 players. Um, 15 players felt pretty left out <laughs> because Majority of them couldn't play sevens. If they're anything like me, there was never well, there was definitely too much green on the pitch. So they weren't going to be running around playing sevens. Um, so we saw improvement in results. We saw the sort of strategy coming together, and we qualified for the Olympics. We missed out on the on an Olympic medal, but actually we we qualified for the Olympics. Um, but 
there were still a lot of things that were pretty challenging within that, within that change. As I say, 15 players left out. Um, the environment itself, the physical environment that we'd set up for the sevens programme was, was pretty challenging. Um, <coughs> we talk about unintended consequences. One of the things that we assumed was that players would adapt to a professional environment really quickly and actually they struggled and they, they massively struggled with the change. So whilst they were pretty happy to get contracts, struggling, struggled to, to adapt to the change not everybody, but a, a large proportion of the, the squad. So a lot of our time was spent on, on, on that. So how would we do that differently in terms of education and things um, going forward? And the 15s players and kind of the focus on, on those, those players completely dropped off. They just won the World Cup. And then actually they felt like they'd fallen off the end of a cliff. Um, even though they'd known what was going to happen they actually, the, the piece for them was that they then felt that they were no longer being supported and, and uh, looked after. So, um, just moving forward. I, oh, I've got it in my hand. I'm going mad. Sorry. Um, situation talked about. My role was actually to lead all of those things. Um, the last part of the equation is that coming out of the Olympic Games, we then switched to 15's full-time contracts. Um, we told the players it was short-term contract and then we were moving back to 7's. <coughs> um, so we ended up with a sort of highs and lows of being full-time, not being full-time. And actually, whilst I'm not... I think it... I'm not convinced there was any other way to use our resources. The problems of doing it is that the environment was challenging. We assumed players would adapt to change. The unintended consequences were for 12 months, the 15s were fairly disengaged. And coming back to one of the pieces about at the start about me being involved in, in coaching um, the Six Nations after the, the World Cup, um, I was actually involved then in coaching a team that were relatively disengaged, um, which was very challenging personally, but also for that, for that squad. We'd, we'd agreed that it was time to change the coaches, that there was a, a movement of coaches. We hadn't yet appoint, appointed a new, new set of coaches, um, but that we went in, finished fourth in that Six Nations, which is the worst result we've ever had in the Six Nations. So unintended consequences were disengagement, and poor performance. Um, and the last piece on here, I, I've touched on it, the long-term picture, we talked to the press, we talked to the media, we, we articulated our plan of going to full-time contracts, talked about sevens, talked about build-up to the Olympic Games. What we didn't do well enough was tell everybody what phase two and phase three were. And phase two was then moving to 15's contracts, and phase three was actually then moving back to sevens contracts. So there was a whole piece in there that we hadn't articulated the, the whole of the narrative. We'd, we, we'd articulated some of it to everybody. Um, so when I talk about the, the longer term piece, that, that's, that's the piece there. So my, the, the third example um, that I just wanted to share in terms of change um, situation, so we talked about, talked then a, a little bit about um, disengaged 15s players. Post that World Cup, as I say, we finished fourth in the Six Nations and it wasn't just that players were disengaged, we had lost a number of players through the World Cup, but also a lot of the younger players coming through weren't probably of a high enough standard to be able to compete effectively in the Six Nations. So the domestic league wasn't at that time producing uh, producing future England, England players. So what did we do? We engaged a consultant we, uh, who, who looked at where we were, 
reviewed the whole situation, consulted with current clubs. Um, we proposed, or the consultant proposed uh, a new direction with myself. Um, we ultimately brought in supporters. So my role was ultimately in this piece was to lead and to lead the whole piece from, from the start. Um, we brought in supporters. We brought some advocates in for who agreed with, with what we were trying to do, which was effectively to professionalise the or set up a new sort of professional women's league. And I say professional with a small p, so that's not about paying players, but it is a new league with min minimum operating standards, with a professional infrastructure that drives the standards of the game going forward. Um, we had that approved by Women's Performance Management Group. We prepared a detailed strategy um, that was then taken <coughs> to board and council for approval. And just to go back about the piece about supporters, it was vital to have those supporters on board from an early point who clarified the direction of things that we needed to do. We needed to make sure that we went through certain boards at certain times. We went to the council at a certain time. We went through to governance. There are a number of committees at the RFU that need to go through to get anything actually finalised. But we had some supporters that were really clear and really helped us go through the, the committee structure as it stands to, to make sure that we, we move that forward. Um, we got approval uh, for the, for the um, it, we got approval in principle. We then had to do the detailed paperwork that we needed to put in place, um, and that finally w went through board and council in October uh, 2016. Um, we informed current stakeholders of the agreement and gave them the implementation plan. So we, you know. We planned, we articulated the plan, we engaged with stakeholders. Um, and I think you know, we talk about things that, things that you learn when you put changes in place. The level of detail that we needed to do to make put what in, in effect what was a, a major change for the RFU was quite considerable. You know, we had to, we, we were moving from within the RFU, there's a, a a general principle of promotion and relegation. We moved from promotion and relegation to um, to a tender process, to effectively a, a tender process or a franchise process where the people with the best bids got to be in the new league. Now that went against the fundamental principles of, of where the game had always been. So how we went through that was, was quite challenging. The level of detail that we needed to put in place was was big in order to make sure that that change happened, um, and I think the, the one of my biggest lessons is that we got that piece through, but the work started at that point. Um, the implementation of actually the change was huge. Uh, the the work that we needed to put in to make sure that we got the process right to get the right clubs in the league. Um, took months. Um, we went through we went through the tender process. We had to go through an appeals process. Um, the level of scrutiny through uh, having legal counsel looking at the documents, how we'd done things, how we'd come to decisions, was was really was tough. Um, fortunately, because we'd got the right supporters on board at the right time we'd got the process in place, we'd got the right process in place, that everything stood up to scrutiny, everything stood up to, to legal scrutiny. Um, but I think it's, it's just sort of important to understand what, I suppose, the, for me, the, the breadth of the change was. It's very easy to stand and say, we're just changing the league. The piece that that affected was, was absolutely was absolutely massive. We had to change the pathway in order to make sure that the new league fitted into the new player pathway. And therefore, we had to t 
talk to everybody about what the new player pathway was. We've had to look at the second tier of the women's game because actually the impact of changing the top tier of the women's game affects the tiers lower down. So how does that work? What does that look like? When are we going to do that? All of those pieces were bits of the jigsaw that we had to try and bring, that we had to try and bring together. Um, you know, we've still got a number of outstanding issues that we, are, that we had agreed that we would review once the competition was up and running. Things like, what does promotion and relegation look like going forward? Is it promotion and relegation? Is it a new tender process? But what we agreed, because I think to, to organise, to go through some of this detail and to get everything put in place, would have meant that we were two years down the line before we'd actually implemented it. So part of the plan, part of the change plan, was to actually say, look, this is what we've got to do, and this is what the review process is going to be, because if we need to make changes beyond that to get the outcome of what we want, this is where this is where we're going to have to review, this is what we're going to have to look at. But let's see how far we've got, because it's very difficult to <laughs> understand exactly what will be affected by the change until you've actually put the change in place. So putting that in place and going through more of an iterative process to, to understand the next steps was, was where we got to and, and clearly... Um, clearly articulated that as, as to where we were going. Um, I think in terms of, in terms of lessons, um, for me, understanding the process, who needs to say yes, being clear and transparent um, was, was really important in terms of what we were trying to achieve and why. Um, you can't please everybody. There are still people that probably won't still say hello to me because I'm not their favourite person because of the change that we've put in place. I think the vast majority of people are now really supportive of the change we've made, the introduction of the new league, can see the benefits that the league is bringing, but there are definitely people that aren't happy. And I think that, that last one, and I've touched on it a couple of times today, you need people on side, you can't do it all yourself. Getting people in to support what you're doing is, is, is really key. Um, so, last piece, um, probably tried to sum up and tried to sum up some of those messages uh, that, that I've talked about. Um, Culture and environment sets the scene. I haven't talked too much about culture, but I think ultimately it underpins everything you do. The better your culture is, the more supportive it will be for the changes that, that you're going to make, the more people trust you in terms of um, what you're going to do. And that links to that next point, that trust from stakeholders is, is key. The vision has to be clear and, and agreed and, and people buy into it. Um, Manage expectations and, and communicate early. Uh, going back to the example about the RFUW, th I think the earlier we would have been able to communicate some of the outcomes, the earlier we would have got people on board. Um, people are individuals and that they do take everything differently. Um, for me, and I haven't really talked on this, but actually it goes back to the bit about what my leadership values and behaviours are. If I, if I stick, try and stick to those, then I'm being authentic because that's kind of who I am, really. Um, don't try and change the world by yourself. That's a big one for me, personally. That's one of the big things that, that I've learnt. And whilst we try and look after everybody, we can't please everybody. Um, and that there are some things, there are some changes that we've got to make that will develop the game, increase performance, and that people will be affected by it. So we're not going to please everybody. People often don't like change. Um, thank you very much for listening. Uh, that's
all I've got to say. I think I've been talking for quite a long time, really. Um, so I do apologise. Uh, thank you. <laughs>